Numbers chapter 20, verses number 6 through 12 is where we're taking our text today. Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they fell face down on the ground. And then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, You and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. And as the people watch, speak to the rock. Everybody say, speak to the rock. Speak to the rock. And it will pour out its water, and you will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told, and he took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come together at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Sounds like Moses kind of starting his message like I started my conversation with you today. Listen, you rebels, he shouted, must, must we bring water from this rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock. And I know that some of you want to say that he did it accidentally. But read the next word. Twice. It wasn't an accident. He struck the rock twice with the staff and water gushed out so the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. But the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land that I am giving them. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today from this thought, blind spots. Blind spots. Everybody with me? You going to help me today? Amen. Father, I thank you for the opportunity. I don't ever take lightly this, this time. It's humbling to me. It's serious to me. I want to speak your word. I want people's lives to be transformed and changed. I don't want to waste people's time today, God. I don't want to waste eternity today. I want to do what you've sent me to do, and I want to get out of the way and let you do what only you can do today. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak this word. Thank you for people who've gathered here in your house today, and we're going to be careful to give you praise for all that you've done. And everybody said in Jesus' name, Come on, turn around and shake somebody's hand and you may be seated here today. Amen. Amen. Let me start by saying today that I believe that Jesus is more than just a good example. Amen? I believe today that Jesus Christ is our liberator. I believe that He has come to set free. I believe that He has come to break the chains off of every life that we sang about here this morning. I believe today that you nor I were ever designed or created to live in containment. I believe today that just because you've grown accustomed to something, that doesn't mean that that is God's purpose for your life. I believe that it's possible for you to have grown accustomed to things and accept them as your reality, but that is not God's intention for your life. I believe that that's why men and women who become part of the system and get into institutionalized, there's a mentality that comes along with being institutionalized. And men and women were never created to live behind bars. Men and women were never created to be held captive. That is not how God made us and God designed us. But whether by actions of others or by their own actions, if people find themselves in that circumstance, there is a institutionalized mentality that begins to set in. And when people get put in 
confinement, they begin to adjust to that confinement. They begin to accept it as the new norm and their new reality, and they start living within the confines of that containment. And when they, if they, if and when they are ever set free from that, that is why many times they have a hard time adjusting to life here with more freedoms because you can get used to and accustomed to containment. It's not God's priority in your life, but you can get used to it. And, and I want to say this for every person sitting here today. If, if nobody else has ever told you this, then allow me be, to be the first to declare to you that God has plans for your life. God has plans for your life. Plans that cannot be contained uh, within the limitations of your circumstances. Plans that cannot be contained within the limitations of your experiences. Isaiah said it like this in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse number 4. He said, for since the world began, no ear has heard, no eye has seen a God like you who works for those who wait for Him. Paul quoted that scripture in Corinthians when he told the church at Corinth, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. I want to say again to you this morning that God has plans for your life. You may not know all about it just yet. You may not recognize it just yet. You may not understand it all just yet, but God has plans for your life. God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter number 29 that no matter what you see right now, Jeremiah, whether your present circumstances or, or your present uh, experiences, those are not your future realities. He said in verse number 4, this is what the Lord of Heaven's army, the God of Israel says to all the captives that He has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat food that they produce. Uh, uh, marry and have children. Then find spouses for those children so that they may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and the prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for that city because its welfare will determine your welfare. And then he went on to say in Jeremiah 29, 10 and 11, this is what the Lord says, you will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things that I have promised. And I will bring you home again for I know the plans I have for you said the Lord they are plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope could I say to somebody here today that no matter what your present circumstances are no matter what your realities are and I'm not saying that you're not in a situation that is confining at the moment but your current situation is not an indicator of your future reality. God has plans for you. God has a purpose for your life. Amen? Come on, He has a purpose for your life. He didn't tell them that they knew the plan. He said, I know the plan. Mm. Amen? I know the plan. But see, th there's something that you need to understand about God's plans. His plans are His preferences. God's plans are His preferences. It's what He prefers for my life. And it's what He prefers for your life. But stay with me. Because if His preferences are to become our experiences, then it's going to require our participation. Amen. Mm. That was good right there. Hallelujah. I, I mean, that was good. Hallelujah. If His plans are going to become your experiences, it's going to require your participation. See, people want God to do everything. And God has already done what God is going to do. The battle is over. It is finished. He requires you now to step into what He has already done. Hmm. Okay. See, God has preferences for me. And God prefers that my life and your life arrive at His desired destination for us. Come on. But whether or not that happens is based on me being in partnership. Yeah. 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 Hmm. 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 Things that make you go, hmm. 
He has preferences for me. God desires and wants certain things in my life. But whether or not those things come to pass requires me to partner with Him. It's not, listen, it is not strictly up to God. Oh, I know I'm, now I'm talking sacrilege with some of you. It is not strictly up to God. Oh, come on, Larry, you're out of your mind. No, I'm not out of my mind. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, came into this earth, took on the form of, of, of a man, came to this earth, went to Calvary, made the way for you to be saved. But there will be people when the end draws uh, to a conclusion that will not be saved, not because there was not a way made and not because God did not prefer it, but because they did not partner with what he had already done. It's not strictly just up to God. You have a part to play in your own deliverance. You have a part to play in your own life. You can't come in here. I know it would be so easy to come in here and allow Larry to pray over you and allow Larry to pray for you and allow Larry to go live your life for you and allow Larry to make all your decisions for you. But Larry has his own plate full. you got to participate in your own life. You have to decide that if I want to see the preference of God in my life, I must participate in the plan of God for my life. See, God wants it, but that's not enough. You've got to want it. Hmm. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some things that are going to hurt people's feelings today, and I'm fully prepared for the brunt of all that and the nasty emails and everything else that comes with it. But I realize today, listen, I can't explain everything to you, uh, but I, I realize that not everybody we pray for gets healed. I understand that. He's a sovereign God. I, I get that. I'm, 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 not here to, I'm not here to defend him. He needs no defense. All right? But here's what I am telling you. I believe that there are people, there are some people who could be healed, but choose to stay sick. Because if they got healed, they'd have to quit making excuses. Yes. Yes. Hello. There are some people that could be set free from addictions, but they like the pity. Oh, man. Thank you, Jesus. Seriously. There are people that have grown accustomed to that. Containment mentality. Confinement mentality. They didn't mean to go that far, but since it went that far, they've accepted it as their new norm, and as this is just a lot that life has thrown me, so I'm just going to go ahead and live it out and play it out when God has a different plan for their life, but they won't participate in the plan. That's right. Amen. That's right. Come on. <laughs> Oh, man. I should be done by now. See, here, here, here's... You, you have to want something for yourself. Mm. There are... Woo. Jesus... Hallelujah. I'm trying not to get into stuff today. Mm. Mm. There are people who will stay on some sort of assistance. Because it's easier to take than it is to get up and have responsibility for my circumstance. God did not intend for you to live on a welfare mentality. Do you know that welfare mentality is a slavery mentality? Do you know that? Do you know that? Because what you're doing is you're allowing a system, a corrupt system. You are allowing a sinful system. You're allowing a, a system that is based in sin to, to dictate to you what you can have, where you can have it, and how much of it you can have. And God never intended for you to live in that kind of containment. God, God wanted you to be free. But see, He has a plan for your life, but His plan includes you getting up every morning before three in the afternoon. Okay, hallelujah. 
I guarantee you this, this is not going to be downloaded on the podcast this week. I, I guarantee you there will be no downloads of this message. Where's Bishop Tony? Where's Bishop Tony? Look, he's in Oklahoma City. You're stuck with me. I'm just going to tell you the truth here today. I'm going to tell you the truth. God has a plan for your life, but you have to participate in that plan. None of that's in my notes. You got all that for free today. See, if, if you can't or won't see for your life what God sees for your life, you're, you're going to be sentenced to containment and you will never experience the freedom or the fullness of the life that God prefers you to have and live. My son is an excellent waiter. If you've ever been to a restaurant where my son has waited on you, waits tables, you don't ever have to ask for anything. You never have to ask for a glass to be refilled. You never have to ask for a plate to be removed. You never have to ask for a plate to be brought out. If the kitchen makes the order different than what you asked for, he catches it before it comes to the table. You don't, you don't never know that. He takes care. He does all that. But I asked him several months back, are you willing to always wait on tables and just be a waiter? Or would you like to have people who do that answering to you? And we had a conversation, and then some excuses started. Well, that's how I hear him when he makes excuses. It's like, just all cut up. Because I'm, I'm not in tune with that. That's how I hear some of you when you come and ask me for advice, and I start giving you advice, and you start making excuses. It, 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 it. Because how in the world can a person help you if you won't listen to what you're asking them for? <laughs> And, and Chaz, we, we've been talking about this for a while, but, but Chaz took the bull by the horns and he said, man, I'm not going to worry about my past. I'm not going to worry. He, uh, listen, God, if, if God's in it, God will make a way. So, you know what? We preached to you here a few weeks ago. Life won't give you what's fair. It'll only give you what you demand. So he began to demand some things. He began to put some things out there. He began to throw some things out there. And I could, man, I, he, he about bugged me to death for two weeks because of all of the phone calls that he was getting back. And, and listen, all the, all the stuff that began to come back into his life, but if he would have just accepted his lot, accepted his role, accepted what other people said about him, accepted what a system wanted to put on him, he would be in the same position. And you can say all the time, well, he's your kid. That's why it happened for him. I don't know anybody in Galveston, Texas. That's God's kid, not my kid. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're God's kid, and He has a plan for your life, but you have to participate in the plan. Somebody help me today. You must, you must, you must, you must, you must. See, you, you, those of you that won't participate are serving time in an invisible prison of your own thoughts. You're serving time in a prison of your own feelings. I can't tell you how many times lately. This knucklehead right here. I can't tell you how many times lately that I've, I've looked at him and made him look me in the eye and say, get out of your head. Get out of your head. Get out of your feelings. Quit thinking too hard about what it is that you're, you, you want to do and this, that, and the other. If you believe that God has a call for your life and He has a purpose for your life, then lean into the purpose. Lend yourself to what it is that God is calling you to do. Quit staying a prisoner of your own thoughts. Well, I can't because of this. I shouldn't because of this. I won't because of that. You are living in an invisible prison. You're just as locked up as somebody at Hutchins State Jail right now. Because you are living in containment in your mind. But if you could ever begin to participate in what God wants to do in your life, doors would open for you. 
See, God sees great things for you and in you. But God seeing it's not enough. Because if you can't, don't, or won't see what God sees, then you'll never see what God is saying Amen. about your life. Moses was a man for whom God had a plan. Part of God's plan for Moses' life. Is this okay today? Good. Part of God's plan for Moses' life was to use him to lead Israel out of Egypt. To lead them out of one place, Egypt, into another place, Canaan, or the Promised Land. And you can go check me out on this, but anytime God spoke to Moses about the assignment that he had for his life, he always talked to Moses about Canaan. God never mentioned to Moses the wilderness. Because the wilderness was just a pass through. It was supposed to be just a pass through. That was not God's preference. That was not where God wanted His people to be. He wanted them out of Egypt and into Canaan land. The wilderness was just a space and time they had to go through to get from point A to point B. So when God was speaking to Moses about his assignment, he did not talk to him about the meantime or the place in the middle. He talked to him about point A and he talked to him about point B. See, some of you are frustrated because you're in the middle, but God isn't wanting to talk to you about the middle. He's wanting to see how you'll handle the middle because what he said over your life is point B. He wants to get you to where he's trying to get you to go. You just have to keep walking through the middle part. Yeah. Mm. Anybody still here today? Listen. Canaan, not the wilderness, was God's preference. And for Moses, that was also God's preference. That he live in Canaan. But the scripture teaches us that Moses and a whole lot of other people never arrived at the place of God's preference and they stopped short of the fullness that God intended for their lives. I know we like to, we like to preach about Moses and the rod and the waters rolling back and all the plagues. And we like to teach about Moses and the Ten Commandments. But what we fail to tell you at the end of the story is Moses didn't really fulfill his purpose. Moses never got to go to the place that he was assigned to lead the people to. See, Numbers chapter 20 is a conversation between God and Moses about a need that the people had. The people needed water. And God tells Moses, I, I got about 20 minutes, stay with me. God tells Moses, he said, I want you to go over there and I want you to speak to that rock. And water's going to come out of that rock. And the reason that I want you to speak to that rock is because I don't only want the people to have their need met, but I also want them to know and to see who it is that's meeting their need. And God told Moses, he said this, and I, I'm, I'm implying some things that are in the story maybe that aren't, aren't written in black and white, but the reason that God was going to use a rock is basically what he was trying to tell Moses is, I'm going to use a rock because if I were to use a river, the people would think the river is their source, so I want the water to come out of an unexpected place so that people will realize that the only reason that they got water is because God made a way where there didn't look like there was a way. See, if God let, Corey said it, if God let you have everything that you think you want and the way you want it, you would think it was about you. Amen. But God wants to do some things in your life that there's no other way but Him getting the credit. He's yeah. still here. Now hear me, refuge. God is not only in the results, He's also in the details. I know they've told you the devil's in the details. But God is in the details. Listen to me. Moses, I want you to speak to the rock so I can show them how I respond to a people in need. But Moses didn't act like the way, or, or he didn't like the way that things were going. And Moses took it upon himself to change the details. God gave Moses specific details. Speak to the rock. But Moses changed the details. And instead of speaking to the rock as instructed, he took his staff and he smote the rock. <sighs> uh -huh. 
How many bosses we got in here? We got any bosses, managers, people in here? Come on. You got any managers in here? Listen, you got people in management in here? Listen to me. How you use your staff, if you use your staff to whip things into shape, you're abusing your staff. If you use your staff out of anger, ain't nobody talking to me today. I'm, I'm just throwing a little leadership in there for you. <laughs> Moses took the staff that had been ordained for one reason and used it for another. He changed the details. And the result was for Moses that he, they got water because God's good. And they got water because they had a need. Which goes to tell you that God can use you even if you're stupid. Come on. Even if you're in it for yourself, God can use you to help other people who have a need. But the result for Moses was, God said, get Aaron and come to the top of the mountain. Because when you get up here, I want you to look over there. You see that over there? Yes, sir. That's Canaan. That's where I was taking you. But now look at it with your eyes because you'll never live in it in your body. So the result for Moses, because he got into himself and changed the details of God's plan was he saw Canaan, but he never lived in Canaan. Stay with me for just a minute. I'm almost through. All across this room here today, there are some people who see some things for your life. There are some people who see some things for your family. There are some people who see some things for your career. I see some things coming on the horizon for this church. I have a vision. I have a dream. I have something in my heart that I believe God wants to do in this house. I see some things for my children. I see some doors opening up. I see a future filled with hope and promise. I see dreams coming to pass. But just because I see it doesn't mean I will live in it. I've got to stick to the plan and not change God's detail mm. 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 see whether or not I arrive at my promise and the place of God's preference and what I see will be determined by what degree I choose to partner with God in designing my life see too many of us in this room this morning are stuck mm. uh, we're, we're, we're stuck in our jobs We're stuck in marriages. Now if you read into that more than is there, that's on you, not me. I'm not telling you to bail out of your marriage right now. I'm telling you to look inside and fix it. Yes. Hallelujah. Easiest thing in the world to do is leave. That's easy. That's easy. That's easy. Man, ain't nobody liking me today. I'm, I, but I'm telling you, I dressed in Teflon. It is just rolling right off, baby. Hallelujah. Listen, man, the easiest thing in the world is, is to, to walk away. The e See, people, people think that geographic and circumstantial situations are the answer to all problems. Man, listen, the answer to all your problems is not moving to, to Timbuktu somewhere. Because if you don't fix what's wrong here, you'll just carry it to Timbuktu. And in a matter of time, it'll manifest itself there. Whew, hallelujah. Man, Larry, you're preaching so good today. I know it, man. This is good stuff. Man, I wish somebody had told me this. I know, man. It would have saved me a whole lot of trouble. Y'all talk among yourselves. I'm talking among myself. I'm helping myself right now. Hallelujah. Look, I I've got to participate and partner with him. And we're stuck. Too many of you are stuck in a joyless condition. Too many of you are stuck in a peaceless condition. You're stuck, you're stuck, you're stuck, you're stuck, you're stuck. You're stuck in your pursuit of real freedom. And you're stuck in a pursuit of deliverance. Because we're, we are sabotaging God's preference by our unwillingness to cooperate and partner with His plan for our life. Too many of you are allowing other voices in your life who aren't as interested in your freedom as God is to determine where you end up. 
That's a storm warning right there. Hallelujah. <laughs> this baby's about to blow in on you right now. Hallelujah. Listen, listen to what I'm saying. You're allowing other voices who are not as interested in your complete freedom as you and God are to determine where you end up in life. Listen to me. If other people don't want you to be free, cut that cord, baby. <laughs> cut it. Well, it's my mother, your mama too. Cut it. Anybody that doesn't want you to pursue God's voice and spoken word over your life, you're, you're going to have to make a choice. Do I want that relationship or do I want my future? Man, I'm preaching hard today. Mm. Some of you in here today are hanging out in crowds that are content to relegate God to words on a page of a book that they consider history and outdated. But God never be intended to be an entity that you just read about. His preference is that you would experience Him. That's why He said in John 14, 16 through 18, and I will ask the Father and He'll give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive Him because it isn't looking for Him and doesn't recognize Him, but you know Him because He lives with you now and later will be in you. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. That's an experience, not a, not a mental ascent. Hmm. Got awful quiet. Kind of know how Chaz feels now. <laughs> now look, I've got to hurry. But Moses got into himself. And by being into himself too much, he created a reality for himself that was never God's intention. God's preference was Canaan, but Moses missed Canaan. Watch this. Ooh, help me, Jesus, right here. Not because Moses didn't miss Canaan because that was God's will. But because Moses couldn't get out of his own way. There are some of you sitting here right now who are in circumstances in your life that are undesirable, and you're saying, Well, this is where I am. It is what it is. Oh, let me slap somebody. <laughs> mm. Well, it is what it is. This must be, you know, this just must be what God has planned for me right now. Is that what God spoke to you originally? Moses missed Canaan, not because it was the will of God for him to miss it. God's will was for him to lead the people. God spoke his word to him. You will lead the people into Canaan. I want you to lead the people into Canaan. I'm going to show you the land that I'm going to lead them, that, that I want you to lead them to. It was God's will for Moses to go into Canaan. But Moses could not get out of his own way, and it was not the will of God that he die before he got to his preferential state. It was his own will that created that. Hmm. So what was the problem? Mo you got time for me to deal with the problem? Okay. So what was the problem? Well, the first thing that was a problem, man, time gets away so fast. One of these days, hold on, I'm going to pause because I don't want to waste my time giving. <laughs> Love it. But one of these days, I'm going to go live out a whole week just any way I want to. And then I'm going to come in here on Sunday and let you preach. And I'm going to give you 30 minutes to straighten me out. And I'm going to let you feel the frustration of that moment. Hallelujah. Okay, that wasn't in the details. I'm going to get back to God's plan. Let me... So... Repentance is key to getting back on course. So, so what was the problem? Well, in order to deal with the problem, you first have to deal with what's not the issue. The Bible says that when God spoke to Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron both fell on their face in worship. They fell face down in worship. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. It is possible to not have a worship or a glory problem and still be stuck. 
I came to say to you here this morning that you can come to church and worship like crazy on Sunday and then walk right back out into stuckness on Monday. Because there are some, there are some prisons you can't worship your way out of. Larry, you're, not, you're crazy. No, I, I just read Moses was stuck in a place and yet he fell down on his face and worshiped and the glory of God appeared there. We can have the most glorious services you've ever been in here at the refuge, but if you're not hearing God's voice, you're going to walk out of here just as stuck. I mean, you can even participate. You can come down here and fall down at the front and people catch you and us throw something over you and sprinkle water on you and spit on you and all that, whatever else. Oh, you hadn't seen that yet? Yeah. <laughs> So he didn't have a worship problem. He didn't have a glory problem. He was worshiping and glory was there. He also didn't have a lack of word problem because God spoke to him. So you can be worshiping, have the glory of God, reading your Bible, praying, fasting, and still be stuck. <laughs> God was speaking to Moses continuously and he still missed the place of preference. Moses moved on a word that brought him from Egypt to the wilderness. He moved based on a word from God, and that word brought him out of Egypt and into the wilderness. But somebody hear me today. What brings you out won't necessarily take you in. Many times when God gets you out, you need to wait on him for the next word to take you in. Because what got you out won't necessarily be the same word that will get you in. Oh, come on now. So he had the glory. He had the presence of God. He had a word from God. He was a worshiper. But Moses still died short of fulfillment. So what was it that kept Moses from living in what he saw with his eyes? I'm going to tell you what it is. Moses had an unaddressed, unidentified emotional issue that he thought would be taken care of by how spiritual he had become and by all the spiritual experiences that he had had with God. He had an issue in his life that he didn't address or identify. And because he didn't address it or identify it, it rose up to bite him. And it rose up to keep him out of the very place that God intended for him to go. Moses didn't miss out on God's preference because of immorality. Is that, is that okay? He didn't miss out on God's preference because, I mean, Moses didn't sleep with somebody else's wife. Moses didn't get drunk and then come to church and try to preach. Come on. Moses, you know, Mo Moses didn't have a moral collapse and a moral failure. That was not what kept Moses out. But the thing that kept Moses out was Moses made a decision based out of emotional immaturity. Ooh, I am preaching good right now. Larry, I don't understand. Well, let me break it down for you. Moses had an anger issue. And it goes back, way back. Way back in Moses' life. I'm not here to try to psychoanalyze Moses. I don't know. Or maybe I am. This isn't in your Bible. I'm just telling you, God's like kind of let my imagination run wild. But I think that there were some things that happened in Moses' life that dealt or that, that uh, contributed to his anger problem. Because if you will remember this, Moses, while he was being raised in, in Pharaoh's house, he was being raised in favor. He was being raised with everything that his own people did not have. Yet in that situation, Moses went out and killed a man. And then when he tried to justify it to his own people, they said, hey, we saw what you did yesterday. And Moses got mad at them and ran. Moses had an anger problem and his anger might have or, or, or stemmed from the fact that, you know, in, in all reality, I know what you're going to say, but in all reality, he was abandoned by his mother in all reality. She nursed him, but once he was off milk, she was out of the picture. 
And he, he didn't have anything to do with his mother. And he's raised by people that weren't his own people. And he's raised in an environment that he was different than. And he always had this spirit of rejection. And the Egyptians wouldn't accept him. And then when he tried to rise up and be the man that God wanted him to be, even the Hebrews wouldn't accept him. And so he was rejected over and over and over again. And it created a, an anger issue. Come on, somebody. And he never dealt with it. Because when God called him to be a deliverer, Moses made the same mistake that a lot of us make. Moses thought that his calling would automatically bring healing. Woo! Your calling does not automatically bring healing. But I'm called, Pastor Larry. I'm called to do this work and that work and this work. Well, then you better deal with your issues. Because if you don't deal with your issues, your issues that are unidentified and undealt with will rise up to try to rob you of God's preference in your life because your calling does not heal you. Only God can heal you. And He can't heal what you will not identify. Hmm. I don't understand, Larry. I know that's why I'm going to keep going for a few minutes. You may have an encounter with God like Moses had that is so strong that it makes your face glow. Because Moses went up to the mountain and got in the presence of God, and God was so thick that when Moses came down from the mountain, he had to wear a veil on his face because his face shone with the glory of God. People knew that he'd been in the presence of God. You may have an encounter with God that is that strong that everything on the outside of you glows. But just because things are glowing on the outside doesn't mean things are fixed on the inside. And just because you have an issue that has been dormant for a while doesn't necessarily mean that you have been delivered. Dormancy does not equal deliverance. Hmm. So Larry, what do I need to do? Here it is. Let me, give you, let me give you a good definition that you can write down and use for deliverance. Is that okay? Man, I'm sweating and I'm not even working hard today. Hallelujah. Here, here's deliverance. How do I know I've been delivered? And it's not just lying dormant. Here's the way that you know you've been delivered. The way you know you've been delivered is when you are given an opportunity to respond like you used to would have but you choose a different response. That's when you know you have, come on somebody. That's when you know you've been delivered. You know you've been delivered when somebody steps up on you and you walk away from that not having smacked them because you said two weeks ago, I would have knocked the snot out of them, but I've been delivered and my response is different today than it was then. Ain't nobody liking me today. Mm. Deliverance is when I choose to do different. Deliverance. Deliverance is just because it's available, I don't take it. Woo. Deliverance is just because I can and nobody will know I don't. Because he knows. Oh, man, ain't no. Ooh, Jesus. See, some of you are operating in blind spots. And it's the blind spots, the things that you haven't identified yet, that are keeping you from God's preference. Am I making any sense today? I'm almost done. Stay with me. Stay with me. Because i got to give you some truth this morning. See, you, you have to get unstuck. I have five minutes. You have to get unstuck today. And you have to deal with your issues. Because if you won't cooperate and partner with God in His preference for your life, it doesn't only just affect you. It affects those who are connected to your assignment. Larry, I don't believe that. Okay. Good. Good. Because I'm going to be Moses and you be Aaron. Sorry. Sit on the front row is dangerous at this church. I know some of y'all are like, my God, he's picking on guests. He's picking on guests. Listen, they've been three times. It's over. Hallelujah. <laughs> so JR is going to be, JR is going to be uh, 
Aaron and I'm Moses and God speaks to Moses and tells Moses you're gonna be the deliverer but Moses you got a little speech problem and you're a little intimidated so I want you to get Aaron and Aaron's gonna be your mouthpiece and I want Aaron to work in conjunction with you now then we get out of Egypt and now we're in the place where they need water and when God gets ready to meet their need through speaking to the rock he tells Moses go get Aaron and bring him with you and so he gets Aaron and they come up there and God speaks to both of them now and tells them Moses listen and Aaron you pay attention because here's what I'm telling Moses Moses I want you to speak to the rock and I'm gonna show the people how wonderful I am and I'm gonna give them water for them and their cattle and their livestock the whole community is gonna be good and I want you to follow the details and and Aaron is standing there listening to what God is instructing the instruction is not even to Aaron it's to Moses but Aaron is connected to Moses and so Moses gets into himself. We read it to you. You bunch of rebels! He didn't call them God's children. He didn't say the elect, the beloved, the favored of God. He said, you bunch of stinking rebels. So sick and tired of messing with you people. Why do we have to call water out of this rock? I'll show y'all. Call water out. I'm not looking like an idiot and speaking to a rock. Tum, tum, stupid rock. And water gushes out. And the people are satisfied. And God says, Moses, get Aaron mm -hmm. and come up here. Yeah. Yeah. Moses, I saw what you did back there. And you did opposite of what I commanded you to do. So I want you and Aaron to look over there. Look. <laughs> Pretty good, isn't it? Pretty awesome. That's a great land over there. Woo! God, that's some good stuff you got over there. And we know you're a loving and a merciful and a kind God. And God says, yes, I am, Moses. But you nor Aaron will see it because you did what I told you not to do. Amen. Amen. Moses' decision just didn't affect Moses. It affected the other person that was given to him to complete his assignment. And when you forfeit your assignment, God no longer has need of those who are connected to your assignment. And so your death creates death in them. Thank you. Listen to me. I'm giving you revelation today. That's why some of you need to get unstuck and you need to get unstuck this morning because your spouses and your children are going to feel the effect of you not doing what God prefers to have done in your life. And it won't be their fault. It's just them being connected to you. I'm telling you, your children can be stuck because you're stuck. Uh, I'm done. I want you to get... get I'm, I'm going to try to finish. That Break Every Chain song will be good if y'all... Or it would be greater if we could sing it. That'd be good. Y'all did so good on it. But somebody said, listen to me. I'm, I'm sorry to pick on my son and my family so much this morning. But I want to tell you, there's no greater... Listen. Larry, don't you want your family to be near you? Yeah. I'd love that. I love, I love that. I love my... My daughter was in California. They came back home. My son was away. He came back home. You like your family being... I love my family being near me. My kids live across the alley from me. Chaz and Erica live across the alley. Just We can walk back and forth. And, and uh, you can ask them. We don't bother them. You can ask my daughter-in-law. She'll tell you the truth. I don't, we don't bother them. Now, we did pull up in front of their house the other night and call them. And <laughs> say, what are y'all doing? <laughs> Sure is dark in there. <laughs> and Rosanna said, you're creepy. I said, it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> 
But we don't bother them. They do their thing. My daughter and her husband now, they live in Sherman. They do their thing. They want to come to our house, they come. If they don't, we don't browbeat them. But man, don't you want all your family to stay together? Yeah, that's, that's cool. That's great having everybody together. But you know what I want more than that for my family? I want God's preference. And I want their, them to prosper and be in good health as their soul prospers. I want them to have opportunities that I didn't have. I want them to do better than I've ever done in my life. I want God to bless them in whatever they put their hand to do. I want them to find joy because joy will lead to happiness. Not happiness lead to joy. Joy will lead to happiness. Come on. Several years ago, Roseanne and I sat in, this has been a long time ago, but we sat in Red Lobster Restaurant when it was still on Texoma Parkway. That's been a long time ago. And we sat with another minister in a dark corner in Red Lobster Restaurant. John and Debbie, you may remember this guy, Brett Jones. And he came to a church that I was pastoring and he preached a series of messages that catapulted my life into a whole lot of trouble. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it was good kind of trouble, trouble I needed. And he preached a message and he took Rosanna and I to lunch. And we sat at lunch on a weekday, a Monday I believe it was. And we sat at lunch and I came from a very traditional background and I came from legalism and a lot of rules and things like that. And my children were, at the time, my children were, uh, man, that's been, that's been 13 years ago. So my children were 14 and 9. And I remember sitting across the table from this man who I respected very much. And now on Sundays at their church in Humble, Texas, they, they have three different services on Sunday morning with over 3,500 in attendance every single Sunday. Powerful, powerful church. Powerful church. He's the chaplain for Intercontinental, George Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston. Multifaceted man, God's working in great areas in his life. And he spoke to Rosanna and, that, and I that day. And he said, Today, today, on this Monday afternoon, you guys have a decision to make. He said, are you going to go forward in the same vein that you've been and cause your children to have to carry the same baggage that you have carried? Or will you trust God enough even if it's uncomfortable? Ain't nobody talking to me today. And allow God to break the limitations off of your life so He can break the limitations off of your children's life. Come on. At 18 years old, two days after my daughter got married, at 18 years old, she loaded up in a U-Haul and moved 1,400 miles away to San Diego, California at 18 years old. And for the next four years while her husband was deployed to Japan and to Afghanistan and serving our nation, she, at 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, she, in, she was in a city that she had never been in. She lived among millions of people when she had only lived among thousands here. She went to a city. She found her way around. She enrolled in college. She finished her associate's degree. She got a job. She took care of her house. She did all of those things. Because what I want for my children more than I want anything else I want them to have roots, but I want them to have wings. What I want for, this, for the body of this church is I want you to have roots, but I want you to have wings. I want God to be able to take you out of your stuckness and do some powerful things in your life. If you won't fulfill your assignment because of unaddressed issues, you're not hurting just you. You're hurting other people. So Larry Moses got angry. Yes, he did. But you know, anger was not the real issue. Anger is a secondary emotion. 
Think about it with me. You never feel anger first. You always feel something else, and then you feel anger. You feel hurt, then you feel anger. You feel disappointment, then you feel anger. You feel fear, then you feel anger. Anger is a secondary emotion. Anger is just the symptom. And many of us have tried to treat our symptoms without getting to the root of the issue. Moses treated the symptom and it lied dormant for years, but in the end it rose up and cost him God's preference. How did Moses do it? He tried to overcompensate. Moses put himself in God's position and tried to do what only God could do. I got to quit. Three things. Moses overcommitted. Moses wasn't clear about what his assignment was. And Moses undervalued himself. And because of those things, Moses tolerated things that he never should have tolerated. God told him he was about to remove certain people from him. And Moses begged God not to remove people that were causing problems from his life. Stay with me. He begged God not to remove people that were causing problems. And God listened to his prayer and allowed him to stay. And it ended up costing Moses. Listen to me, Refuge. You should never, you should never be sad over losing liabilities. Don't spend too much time grieving over losing a liability. What you should be more concerned about is hanging on to assets. Hanging on to assets because I need the assets to do what God said He would do. I'm going to tell you the pain of not living in God's preference is greater than the pain of seeing people walk away from you. And for those of you that are here today that are imprisoned by blind spots, Luke 4 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that the captives be released and that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. I know I'm not Brian Rayburn and I'm not Tony Miller today, but I am your pastor and I'm preaching to you from a heart of love today. I'm telling some of you that things you won't address and won't identify are keeping you stuck. But if you're ready to be free today, God can heal you of the blind spots and He can break every single chain in your life. Would you stand with me today?